This episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast is sponsored by Dakin's Wound Cleanser. When you're treating persistent, hard to heal, or complex wounds, you need a solution you can trust, like Dakin's Wound Cleanser. Just how powerful is it? Dakin's Wound Cleanser has been proven to kill even highly resistant bacteria like MRSA and VRE within only 30 seconds. It's non-cytotoxic, shelf-stable for two years, and more cost-effective than other wound cleanser brands. When you need a solution you can count on, ask for Dakin's. This episode is sponsored by the Janip Resource Center. Despite migraine being one of the most common diseases and impacting more than 30 million adults in the U.S., many adults still push through the pain rather than speaking openly with their healthcare providers about their symptoms and the impact migraine has on their day-to-day life. Find out more about migraine management by visiting the Janip Resource Center. In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Kelly Fink discusses abortion rights. Today we have Kelly Fink, a family nurse practitioner from Nevada who is also completing her post-master's certificate as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Thank you for having me here today. Why is this topic such a big deal? Well, I don't have to tell you, of course, this topic is a hot one and it sparks quite the debate for several people. I usually avoid this topic when I'm speaking with others because I know it can get so heated. And I have several friends and family that I just don't talk about with this because, of course, we have varying views. And I wanted to talk about this issue because it's on the minds of several of us as we face the difficult change in access to health care for women. And it's important to be a part of that dialogue and not just stand idly by watching the world change and not for the better. Uh, to be honest, though, it wasn't much of a concern for me previously until I had children of my own and considered the consequences for them as we go through this change. For decades, women's right to choose whether or not to continue their pregnancy has been protected, and the opposite is now true since the overturn of Roe versus Wade last year in the contentious case of Dobbs versus Jackson. Each morning, I open up news articles and emails on various topics, and inevitably, another daily story is there about another rule or ban on abortion in another state, or a sad story about a young woman whose life was changed forever because she couldn't get the care she needed. I may then read about another woman who nearly lost her life because the pregnancy that endangered it could not be terminated in the state in which she lived. And this affects women everywhere, not just in states with restrictions or entire bans on abortion. More restrictions in other states means those states without restrictions have the burden of meeting the needs of multiple states who require the services of states where abortion is less restrictive. Patients from restricted states will cross their state's border to neighboring states or nearby states that will allow them to get the services they need. Thanks for sharing those insights on this incredibly important topic. How are we supposed to meet this higher demand of neighboring states? Well, I'm glad you asked that. That's one of the big problems uh, and how other states are impacted. Patients need these services and the need gets distributed to one location versus two. So for instance, let's say Arizona decided to place restrictions on abortion that severely limited access. Patients in Arizona would likely seek care in California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, or New Mexico. Those states then have their patients and a portion of the patients in Arizona to care for. I can't imagine the stressors being added to these neighboring states. Why is this an issue? Patients can be cared for by any proficient provider, right? Yes, that's true but the number of providers isn't necessarily growing at the same pace as the need. If one clinic normally cares for, let's say 2,000 patients per year, and now has to serve the needs of 4,000 to restrictions in neighboring states, how does that clinic meet those demands? The clinic can't just easily increase its square footage, 
or its number of providers or hours of availability overnight. But overnight, a patient can cross the border of their state to request services. This means longer waits for services and delays in care, along with potentially entire lack of access. Consider this scenario. A patient with an unwanted pregnancy at 12 weeks gestation crosses the border from their state to another state to have an abortion because their home state does not allow abortions or restricts them at her gestational age. That patient perhaps used to be able to see a provider within a week or two, now having to meet the demands of surrounding more restrictive states, the wait has expanded up to four weeks wait. So what is this patient supposed to do if a state where they are seeking services only allows the procedure up to 15 weeks? Now, after waiting to see a provider, this patient is 16 weeks gestational age, past the point of allowable gestational age for pregnancy termination in the state in which they are seeking, a, seeking an abortion. What other options would this patient have? Well, she doesn't have a whole lot of other options, and those options are dwindling every day. She is probably limited by funds, access to care, and access to transportation. Because this situation disproportionately impacts more patients who are living in poverty and or have decreased access to health care. She may or may not be able to go to another state with less severe restrictions. And even if she can get there, she then has to have the funds to pay for the procedure. Even if she has transportation and the funds to pay for the procedure, what happens if she again is put on a waiting list? What if she has to wait a few more weeks because the delays I previously mentioned will occur in all states? Before you know it, she's past the point of any state being willing to terminate her pregnancy and to either continue the pregnancy unwillingly, which of course has lifelong implications for both the mother and the child, or she tries to end it unsafely herself or in an underground facility or back alley. Does anyone need to be reminded of the women who died before Roe v. Wade because of attempts at self-induced abortion or untrained individuals giving others abortions in their kitchens or motel rooms? Sounds like a bleak scenario. Kelly, are there other restrictions that are impacting access to abortion? Yes, thank you for asking. Let's consider another scenario. Your neighbor's 14-year-old daughter gets involved with a boy at school, and she tells her mother she's missed her period for two months. So she's roughly eight weeks pregnant. She has more than one option to end her pregnancy if she chooses to do so. She can end her pregnancy with medication since she's under 10 weeks pregnant, or she can have a procedure done. Now, not only do more states have total bans on elective termination of pregnancy, The option to end a pregnancy via medication is now also under scrutiny. The medication route requires two medications. The first one is mifepristone, and the second one is mifeprostol. The first and second medications are taken 24 to 48 hours apart. Now some are claiming the FDA approved the first medication taken in the regimen way too quickly and that it is not safe. Those who are challenging this medication want it removed from the market. Some pharmacies are no longer dispensing this medication. The regimen requires two medications, and the second one, misoprostol, can be effective on its own, but it's not as reliable an option to take just the one medication. The combination of both medications is 97% effective. Misoprostol used by itself is 66 to 90% effective in pregnancy termination. It's preposterous, honestly, taking away this safe, reliable means of pregnancy termination. Again, means another less safe option will be attempted, which will mean more deaths of women, which is the opposite of what those who are trying to limit abortion are attempting to do, right? Isn't the argument about preserving and valuing life? I find it pretty ironic that an attempt to eliminate abortion could result in more loss of life, especially when the United States already has one of the highest maternal morbidity rates compared to other developed nations. 
I wanted to also mention that not only is access to these medications in question, the way in which one accesses these medications is also being challenged. With the pandemic, access to healthcare expanded for several issues. Medication abortion was one of those issues, wherein a patient could have medications mailed to them, where before these medications had to be obtained in person and distributed by a provider to the patient in a clinic. The increased access to care that was created by the pandemic eliminated this barrier to care. Several are challenging this access and want to disallow or have already banned these medications to be distributed via mail. That is ironic indeed. How can this really be tracked? Is it that hard to hide something in the mail? That's a good question. No, it's not all that hard to send someone a few pills in the mail to get around this. The problem is, who's willing to do it? The states are threatening to prosecute anyone who assists them, paid for, provides transport for, or in any way enables an illegal abortion, as is actually true in some states. Very few people may be willing to try to attempt mailing medication for abortion. Patients are seeking abortion medications from other countries, and actually several countries are willing to send medications for pretty hefty prices. Some countries are sending medications to patients here for free for those who cannot afford them. The medications are disguised in other ways in the mail or sent to people here in the U.S. who are willing to deliver them in person so that the likelihood of an incident being traced and prosecuted is lower. People have to be willing to break the law and take that risk. Some are willing and some are not, understandably. What is the impact for these patients who are able to get medications in the mail illegally to end their pregnancies? These patients may have no repercussions from the procedure, but if they do, imagine those that will be afraid to seek care. Sometimes there may be heavy bleeding, infection, or what we call retained products of conception. These can all be life-threatening. And if patients are having to obtain medications for abortion illegally, I would assume they would also be reluctant to seek care when they have complications. These patients may fear the legal ramifications of an illegal abortion in states with these restrictions. Kelly, if patients can't have medication abortions, what's the impact of just having a procedure to end the pregnancy? They still can get the abortion they're seeking, right? Well, that all depends on the resources to which they have access. Of course, taking medication is much less invasive. It's safe, it's potentially free or more affordable than a surgical abortion. In some states, medication abortions can be done via telemedicine and very little time off work is required, if any. Let's consider the opposite. A patient can't have a medication abortion in her state any longer. So she elects to have a surgical procedure and qualifies for one because she's within the gestational age restrictions in her state. This is scenario one, and the scenario one is the ideal one. She calls a clinic, gets in right away. Her procedure is covered by her insurance. She has no complications and returns to life as normal. How likely is this to be a reality? Well, it's Now, highly unlikely, I just discussed how these issues affect more people who are already at one or more disadvantages. The situation occurs more in those who are already in poverty or of lower socioeconomic statuses and those who already have poorer access to care. An alternative scenario is more likely to be reality. Let's say she calls the clinic and they are delayed because they have been busier due to surrounding states with total abortion bans, and she can't get in right away, but she'll still be within the acceptable time frame for the procedure. Great, right? Well, not great. The procedure costs $750. It's not covered by her insurance, and the nearest clinic is 125 miles away. She just lost her job. She has no savings and no access to transportation because she lives in a rural community. 
On top of all that, she's already a single mom of three children, has no nearby family or friends for support, and doesn't know what she would do with her kids, even if she could get to the clinic. What happens to her? She may try to end her pregnancy herself, potentially dying in the process, and leaving her three children motherless. Or she could continue the pregnancy, further digging herself into the hole that is her life as a jobless, single mother, now of four children, living in poverty. You mentioned beforehand some are willing and some are not. What do you mean some are willing and some are not? Well, of course it's understandable that some people want to be a part of the solution to this issue. But that means breaking the law for some and its subsequent consequences. We cannot fault those who are not willing to break the law for fear of charges, fines, or jail time. But that's not all I mean when I say some are willing and some are not. In some states, the law is very vaguely written as to what constitutes an acceptable reason to terminate a pregnancy. Because of this, women have been put in dangerous situations. Some women have been near death, needing to have a termination to save their lives. But because they're in a state with vague laws or restrictions, even the threat of maternal death is not enough. In some states, providers will be prosecuted, fined, they may lose their licenses, or they may be sentenced to life in prison for helping these patients if they don't do it strictly in accordance with the law. And when that law is vaguely written, some providers choose not to act at all. This puts more women's lives at risk. What about healthcare providers? How does this affect them? Healthcare providers are at risk in more ways than one. For those who are willing to skirt the laws, and even those in states where abortion is legal, threats and violence against these providers is common from protesters. We can't ask providers to potentially put their lives, their futures as providers, and free citizens at risk to care for others in states where the law is vague. Some argue the law is not vague and that simple medical judgment is needed to determine when a mother's or fetus's life is in danger, but providers are terrified regardless. The law needs more clarity, but until then, several are suffering. This has already happened to several women, many of whom live in Texas, which has extremely restrictive laws about abortion. For example, a woman in Texas at 18 weeks gestation had premature rupture of membrane. In other words, her water broke before it was supposed to, and she was fully dilated. Her baby still had a heartbeat, even though her providers told her she would 100% lose her baby. They couldn't induce her labor under Texas law. This is because her life was not at risk, not yet, and her baby still had a heartbeat. This is true, even though she was potentially at risk of a severe infection that could kill her if she continued the pregnancy. And there was no way the child would survive at 18 weeks. Her providers told her she had to wait until she was sick enough for them to be allowed to induce her labor. So she went home for three days. She waited until she had a fever of 102, and then she returned to the hospital where she nearly died from sepsis because Texas law too vague to allow providers to do something for her beforehand. In another example, a woman pregnant with twins had one of the fetuses with a severe genetic anomaly that was incompatible with life, and it put her and her other fetus's life at risk if she continued to carry both babies. But even this risk was not enough to allow Texas providers to terminate the fetus because the law is too vaguely written. Another Ohio woman, pregnant and bleeding profusely, was initially denied a procedure to end her pregnancy because of restriction abortion laws and fear of prosecution, even though she clearly needed a procedure to stop her bleeding. Only when she returned after passing out from her extensive blood loss was she given the procedure to save her life. Do you think this change in access to these services has had any of its intended consequences of preserving life? Absolutely not. We have to remember that even though abortion is illegal in several instances in which it previously was not, that does not mean it will not continue to occur. 
abortion will happen just as it did before it was legal. But it will happen in less safe ways at later, more risky ages of gestation with increased maternal mortality for women. In a developed nation such as ours, increasing our maternal mortality rate is, of course, appalling, but even more so given that our rate of maternal mortality is more than 10 times that of other high-income nations like Japan, Australia, and Spain, for example. That rate is doubled in an African-American. To think we are doing something that will increase that number is bizarre and leaves me completely bewildered. Kelly, you luckily don't live in one of these restrictive states, correct? No, I don't, but these laws in other states impact me also and my children and others in my state. As I stated previously, access to care in states like mine with fewer restrictions will be decreased as others come to our state to seek the care they can't obtain in their own state. I fear most for my children who are growing up in this world and how their futures will change. They are thankfully living in a state where if their lives mental health or future were at risk because of an unwanted or unsafe pregnancy, they would have access here to the care they need. But I worry, even though we live in a state with fewer restrictions, that this could change in the future, and there's no reason it couldn't. With each of these new restrictions that bans abortion, I imagine a world where women can't vote anymore, show their ankles, or speak when not spoken to. I see a world going in the wrong direction, and I'm afraid of what our futures will look like if this continues. Thanks so much for your time today, Kelly. For more great content from The Nurse Practitioner, be sure to visit us online at tnpj.com for the latest NCPD articles, columns, and much more. Please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and Spotify, as it helps with the podcast's visibility and helps us to keep bringing you this great content. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at The Nurse Practitioner Journal, and on Twitter at TNPJ underscore journal. Thanks for listening. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed on this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, or Walters Kluwer. Please note that the hosts of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast are not clinicians. However, we created the Nurse Practitioner Podcast to bring you relevant clinical information by NPs for NPs. Thanks again for listening.